Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Cynthia, for asking me to do this. After 27 years of marriage to CNN, a few years ago, I embarked on a brief but tempestuous affair with ABC News. <laughs> I am back home now, but the legacy of that dangerous liaison remains, and the most important legacy is friendship and relationships and Cynthia McFadden. It was my great good fortune, almost exactly four years ago, to land on the seventh floor, which was the nightline floor at ABC News here in New York. It was full of energy, full of youth, full of can-do, and of course, all of that was powered by being number one in the ratings. Here, I would like to shout out a congratulations to the creative genius of Jean Marie Condon, who ran it, along with James Goldston, who's now the president of ABC News, a fellow Brit. But my office was right next door to Cynthia's, and we would regularly plonk, each, plonk ourselves in our chairs in each other's offices and talk and gossip and do the tour of the what's hot and what's not around the network and basically exult in how lucky we all were to have great stories to tell and to be able to tell them. Cynthia, I quickly found, is an incredibly generous woman's woman. She is supportive of other women. She doesn't do what many have done, and I have seen it happen, bitch snarkily about other women's successes. Someone once said it's so much easier to sympathize with other people's failures than with their successes. And Cynthia sympathizes and celebrates other women's successes. She promotes and she mentors the young ones, and she leads by her own fine example. I can tell you, when I first joined CNN in 1983, I had a woman boss, I thought it would be great, but she really reduced me to tears regularly by belittling me, ridiculing my abilities and my commitment. So I'm doubly, doubly grateful when I see real stars of our business do the opposite and mentor people and bring them up. Nightline's legions of amazingly talented women really did have Cynthia to look up to and to learn from, and NBC can look forward to having that soon as well. And they can also look forward to getting one of the best journalists and the best interviewers in the business. Cynthia is super smart. She's a law school graduate, and her past experience at Court TV News means that she approaches an interview, no matter with whom, with the kind of prosecutorial, prosecutorial zeal and intellectual ferocity that is actually so exciting to watch on television and really reels the subject in so dexterously. It's brilliant to watch, and we're going to see her go back to her roots doing that as the chief legal correspondent and investigative correspondent for, a for NBC News. Cynthia is also brave. She's deciding at this age and this stage to take a leap of faith to be courageous and firm in her belief in her own destiny and her own dreams. And of course, I said she's going to get back to her roots. And here I'd like to say, ladies and gentlemen, that notwithstanding the array of superb talent that we see on this dais, the amazing talent amongst women who we see spread around this building, the American workplace remains a fairly unfriendly, sometimes even hostile place for American women. There are far too few female CEOs. There are no, until just recently, female heads of news organizations. And a shout out to my fellow Brit, Deb Turness, who is now the president of NBC News and will soon be and is Cynthia's new boss. What about equal pay for equal play? All women in our business and every other should, should get at least as much for what they do as what men do. And it is only until <laughs> it's only until women leverage their formidable economic power, such as Cynthia does, that there will be real equality for women. And we just heard that women make up 80% of the spenders, 40% of breadwinners in this country, either sole breadwinners or the main breadwinners, are women in this country. And what about? European-style childcare and maternity leave that help women climb that ladder and do those multiple jobs that keep our societies going. And here, I would like to end on the personal, because as a single working mother of a superb young man, Cynthia has achieved the greatest triumph in my book. She's been and is a brilliant mother, a brilliant parent, 
and she's also scaled the highest heights of her profession. So for that alone, you deserve this award, and I'm thrilled to be able to give it to you. Well, well, well. First, a great big loving thank you to Christiane Amanpour here from London to do the honors today. I can think of no one it would mean more to me to have than you, my brave and wise friend, for, to present this award. You know, after Christiane's remarks, I think I would be smart to just sit down and say thank you. But any of you who know me know that I am not going to let go of a captive audience that easily. So here goes. When I got the phone call several months ago now from the gang of four, Lisa, Ellen, Maury, and Cindy, all former Matrix winners and all very dear friends, telling me that I had been chosen as a Matrix winner this year, I actually let loose a great big whoop. Woohoo! I have attended this lunch for nearly two decades and am really honored to be included in the group of women who have won in the past, many of whom are my friends, and this incredible group of women today. But full disclosure, when that call came last fall, I was a very different person than I am today. Back then, I was a lifer at ABC News. 20 years into a totally gratifying and engaging career, I realized I had stopped dreaming and imagining. Life was easy, it was comfortable, and fairly predictable. I quit. <laughs> Today, I'm poised to begin an exciting new journey at NBC News, a company I might note run by women. And while I admit to a certain degree of terror at upending my comfy perch, and many dear friends from ABC, many of whom are here today, thank you guys, it is a wonderful, unexpected second act, an opportunity to take a deep dive into the kind of work I find most meaningful, legal, and investigative. It also makes me feel surprisingly younger. So if you haven't changed jobs in 20 years, think about it. You know, I used to think that women who won the Matrix Award, well, those were people who had really arrived. They had it all figured out and I have learned better. There is only the journey. When I first came to this big, bad city, a girl from a small town in Maine, I had the good fortune to become the unlikely friend of Katherine Hepburn. It's a long story. <laughs> Actually, the key to the long story, my college roommate is sitting right here, Amy Baird. You know, Kate used to say about her own career, Getting there was a hell of a lot more fun than staying there. <laughs> staying put is a boa. So since this is a sort of girlfriend kind of lunch with a few good men thrown in, <laughs> I will pass on to all of you, my friends, six of Katherine Hepburn's many rules for living. Never use an electrical appliance before 4 a.m. <laughs> Never sleep on sheets which are any color other than white. It changes the personality. <laughs> Always cut or steal your own firewood. Never pay for it. <laughs> Never wear yellow. It sallows the skin. I hope none of you have yellow on. Take care what habits you adopt when you're young. You're going to be stuck with them when you're old. <laughs> and this, practice forgiving people. You'll have to do a lot of it. <laughs> you know, I was born into rather dicey circumstances. An unwanted baby in a little town in Maine. A week after I was born, two wonderful people, Arlene and Warren McFadden, showed up and said they'd like to be my parents, and they adopted me. I was the first in my family to go to college. 
On the day that I graduated from Columbia Law School, standing there on those beautiful steps, my father gave me the single best piece of advice, career advice, I've ever gotten. Take care, little girl. Now go out and find a job you care about. Anyone can have a job they don't like. My father had been a prisoner of war during World War II, held by the Germans for nearly two years. He had a profound case of PTSD. He also had an unstoppable belief in me. When I landed at Court TV, he and my mother were living in a log cabin that he had built in Cundy's Harbor, Maine. There was no satellite television. He made his way down to the local radio shack and, bought, and built from scratch a satellite dish. <laughs> when the style writer from the Washington Post was doing a little piece on me, called him to ask him about me. He said, Aunt, she's a 10 tree daughter, had to cut down 10 trees to get any reception on that damn satellite. <laughs> anyway, despite their love and despite my belief that somehow not knowing my own ethnicity or anything else about where I came from gave me a certain kind of journalistic broad-mindedness. Looking back, I just think it made me lonely, a society of one. It wasn't until 15 years ago that isolation ended when my son, Spencer, was born. My first biological relative, at least the first one I've ever known. I promised him I wouldn't embarrass him today, but as he is 15 and I am his mother, I'm sure it's too late for that. <laughs> I asked Spencer not long ago how my being a working, traveling mother affected his childhood. Well, it was complicated. But then having you home all the time would have been complicated, too. <laughs> long pause. Let's just say having a mother is complicated. By the day it was announced I was going to NBC, Spencer texted me. Proud of you, Mom. And with that, a new dream job, and now this Matrix Award, life is very sweet, and I'm very grateful. Thank you.